Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so we're here today to talk about Asian representation in classical music. So uh, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Brian Tong. I'm a junior at the Bronx High School of Science, and uh, I don't necessarily dabble in music. I used to, but uh, I would call myself more as a performer uh, in uh, as in acting and dancing in those different forms of art. And I've been doing it for a lot of my life. So yeah. Hi, I'm Rosanna Gao. I am from Long Island, New York, and I attend Great Neck South High School. I'm really involved in musical theater um, and the arts, and I actually sing as well and play piano. So I do have special interest with music um, and chamber music, and I attend choir. I did All County, which is like a choir festival um, where I live. And I'm really excited that you guys are here with us today. So you guys can introduce yourselves now. All right, hey everyone. And uh, thank you too. I, first of all, I just wanna say thanks for having us. And um, I think it's really cool that uh, you guys are doing this. I, I wish I had this kind of drive and, and foresight uh, when, when I was your age to, to engage and start. Uh, these conversations. So thank you. Um, my name is Ace Gengoso. Um, I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, my parents were uh, immigrants from the Philippines. They sort of came over to the States uh, for work in the 70s and the 80s. Once they got settled, uh, surprise, here I came, uh, sort of grew up um, uh, not in a, an extremely musical family, definitely a family that appreciated music. Um, definitely had different interests uh, as, as a student. I remember I had the choice between science and arts magnet um, and I switched. I, I, I don't remember making this decision, but, but apparently I did and surprised the heck out of my parents when I chose arts magnet <laughs> once I went into middle or high school um and got some great opportunities it was it happened to be i happened to go to an arts magnet high school which is where i really fell in love with music um, and theater uh, continued to study it in college um and just kept going uh it, it was sort of the thing to do to go to grad school to continue voice study so i studied uh, I got my master's in voice performance at Northwestern, uh, and I'm still in the Chicago area today, uh, singing with a few groups um, all around town uh, with Jared in, in a couple of those instances, too. So I think that's a great segue. Hey, Jared. Hey, everybody. Uh, echoing what Ace said, I'm so happy to be here and jealous of your guys' um, um, drive and uh drive to take action and be able to start this conversation. Um, yeah, so I, my parents are also from the Philippines. Um, I was born technically in Clinton, Iowa of all places, um, but I'd spent most of my formative years in the Chicagoland area, growing up in the suburbs and uh, went to DePaul University for voice performance. And I have been performing ever since I graduated from my undergrad. So uh, no masters for me. Uh, it's an interesting journey to my um, love of classical music just because uh, my mom's side is, has a lot of professional classical musicians, uh, inc including my one uncle who is who was the winner of the first Pavarotti competition in uh, America. Um, we don't have very similar voices. He's one singing like Amiz Ami and stuff, <laughs> but um, I didn't get, I didn't choose to pursue music until I was a senior in high school. I was quite content on being, going to like hotel restaurant management, um, that kind of thing. And then, but music had always been this constant thing. I was in orchestra for 10 years. Um, I grew up in the church. So singing choirs and learning harmonies, all that stuff. And I just realized that I wasn't going to be good enough with my cello playing to get into music school because I wanted to go into music business instead of performance. Um, but I was like, well, maybe I'll sing and I'll get in. So I got in for music business and then caught the bug and loved performing. And I switched to performance and then I graduated and started getting hired. 
So I've been singing professionally ever since then for the past better part of a decade. Um, of course, I sing with Ace and I sing in Chicago mostly, but I, I've, I've had my fair share of travels. It's great to hear. So both of you are singers, right? Yes. So I'm, well, you guys, uh, I haven't, <laughs> I still haven't decided. I'm still in the middle of like figuring out my life out. And I'm like you, Ace, uh, I, I'm in a science school, technically speaking, but I, I've always been very interested in the arts and I've always wanted to be uh, uh, going, perform, like living my life professionally as an artist but it's, it's like, that's uncertainty. So what made you, what solidified your decision in pursuing uh, your dreams? Um, well, first of all, I'm still figuring out my life. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I, um, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, at the center of it all, of course, is just a love and a passion uh, for music. Um, and not really seeing another path in which I would be really fulfilled. Um, uh, they say, there's that saying, right? Like do something you love and you won't work a day in your life. I think well, I'm, the truth is somewhere in the middle because this is definitely work. <laughs> uh, but I can't imagine myself working this hard and being fulfilled with something else. great how about you jared so what got you interested in uh, uh yeah, yeah like so i said earlier um i wanted to find the right balance between loving music and finding some practicality that's something that a lot of um that my parents wanted to instill in me it's like well you love music is there something you can do that's kind of in the middle and that's how i found music business to be a thing and i was very set on like, oh my gosh i'm gonna be the manager for the next band. I'm going to make sure they get their yellow M&Ms if they want the yellow M&Ms. And I'll still be surrounded by music, but except I'll be in the more of a business side so I can get the best of both worlds. Um, and the way I found myself into performing is just kind of one summer between freshman and sophomore year, my voice kind of grew in terms of, you know, that's just, it just happens. Like you just go through some sort of vocal um, evolution and that's when it happened um, and the way that my school was set up uh, I went to DePaul University which is still a university so it's not a, but it's still a conservatory style music school so we were treated all as music majors at the beginning so we still take all the same classes except for like maybe one specialization class freshman year so most singers will take diction um, which is like being able to learn how to speak, um, speak and read in certain languages, not like to, you know, speak, speak, but know to like read and make it seem as if you do speak. Um, and then of course I had my music business classes as well. Um, but I don't know, I just, uh, as part of my vocal uh, scholarship, you have to audition for all the operas there. And so the first year I didn't get into anything. I mean, freshman, like you're not gonna get anything. Uh, and then sophomore year, I got like a tiny little role in the fall. And when they heard me singing in the fall of sophomore year, they said, hmm, something happened. And they said, hey, why don't you sing the main role in uh, Deflator Mouse? I said, okay. <laughs> so I, I found it as a sign mostly of saying like, well, I'm, without me actually trying to pursue performance, I was kind of being like handed to me, not handed to me, but it's like being presented to me as an option. Um, and I have been extremely fortunate to have the support of my family and parents to kind of chase my dreams. They were, there wasn't very much give when I said, I think I'm switching to performance. There was kind of just a, are you sure? And I said, not really, but I'm going to go for it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't take it back for the world. Uh, I've been able to travel. I've been able to make the most beautiful music ever. Um, a lot of times standing next to Ace. Um, and you know, it's, it was more of a long, a long-term love in which, well, I guess I'm doing performance. And as I started working, I said, Hey, this is kind of cool. And then it's kind of this thing. I'm like, ah, oh, I think this is it. This is the thing. So, uh, for me, it was more of a long-term settling into my love of performance rather than I'm, there are some people that 
are really gung ho about, I want to be performer. Like I will be on the next opera stage. Uh, but that wasn't me. That was more of a long term for me. That's kind of a familiar story for me too, actually. I think back um, and we end up just sort of falling into things that we don't necessarily have in our view. And we just, somebody helps us point us in that direction. And I'm actually thinking back in high school, I loved music. I had been taking piano lessons. I had been in choirs, um, but um, then the school musical came around. Of course, I wasn't thinking of auditioning for it. Um, because I didn't see myself as a soloist or an actor. Uh, I was just in choir. That's all I did. <laughs> uh, and I was very content with that. And then um, my choir director and the theater director said, um, we're doing Les Mis, which has a lot of parts. Um, and we think you can sing and we want you to try it for, for one of the roles. And so I ended up getting cast as Marius as a 10th grader, never been on stage <laughs> in my life, sung a solo or anything. And they're like, here, uh, go sing this leading role uh, to this kid who didn't know anything. But I'm grateful for that because as terrified um, as I was, I remember being told I looked terrified um, and I remember feeling it. Um, I remember the curtain coming down uh, on the last performance. And I remember being like really sad. I was like, oh, I, I, I'm going to miss this and I want to do this again. And I think that was probably one of the moments where I caught the bug, uh, like people like to say. And and that led me to um, say, you know, I don't think there there's really much else that I see myself doing. Of course, that is that's changed. I'm, I'm not singing um, on the national tour of Les Mis or anything like that. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's varied and strayed a little bit in unexpected directions since. But that's really uh, where it got me started, I think. Interesting. So I know you guys have a lot of experiences with musical theater and chamber music and classical music. So throughout your experiences, did you think there was a lack of representation or an excess amount of representation with Asians in classical music? Um, and also, I did Deflator Mouse um, freshman year of high school, and we were going to do Les Mes um, for our musical this year, but with COVID-19, it got canceled. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, as far as representation, I, I, I think... I, I shouldn't speak for all Asians, but I'll, so I'll speak for myself. <laughs> um, I think I have, my experience is that I've been able to sort of ride this line uh, where I'm able to assimilate um, into the different cultural groups that I'm around. Um, and I've always been sort of a go with the flow type of personality. Um, and so I haven't necessarily always been aware um, growing up, I wasn't always aware um, of representation and that sort of thing. I knew I was different, but I also knew that I could sort of get in where I could fit in. Um, and over the years, I guess, as I've grown, as I've worked, um, I don't know if there's a lack of representation as much as there is a lack of the right representation, if that makes sense. Um, I think in classical music, stereotypically, you would think um, a string player, like Asians are Asians are basically the string players. Um, it's interesting because as singers, you don't see a whole lot of Asian uh, Asian men. I think in particularly, like it thought of as as the leading uh, role type. Um, so I, I think there is a a niche of representation, but of, of course, you know, we're capable of more than just playing string instruments. Uh, and, and I think it could be, I think it could be much broader for sure. Yeah, well said Ace. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat. I got, I was extremely lucky to not really experience that kind of, um, I would say, um, discrimination growing up. I mean, you know, in the white, white, white-ish Chicago suburbs. I mean, I was definitely um, one of the very few people of color 
but it was never really, um, it was never really a thing. I've never, was never called a racial slur until, I don't know, I think it was like a, a vacation with my family to like, probably like North or South Carolina. And I just remember um, a tour guide calling us Orientals. Um, and, you know, of all things to be called, it's kind of something like, that's kind of weird. That's a really old term to be using. It's not, doesn't really make sense. And the way my parents describe it, it's like, oh, that's just what they call Asians when they can't find, can't find the word Asian, um, which is like, as a kid, I'm like, okay, I'm just trying to go on this tour of this thing. So I have no idea what, what that's all about. In terms of representation in classical music, it's just, so Asia is the largest con continent, or continent in the world. And we account for almost 60% of the world's population. So, you know, by, by that account, we should be the majority in everything just because there's just so many of us. Um, but what Ace brought up, was really really rings true just because we, we sing with the Chicago Symphony Chorus and we're we get to see a lot of Asian representation in symphonic orchestras um, and you know it's the, work hard I mean it's so hard to get these positions um, it has nothing to and I think it really doesn't have anything to do with their race it's most if they just were the best string they're just were the best players the day they auditioned um, but I can speak mostly for myself and for the singing community that you know Asians are a little underrepresented um, at least in this in what I've experienced in this American system uh, just because you know like you you ask me to name the Filipino or the Asian singers in Chicago I can probably name like all 10 of them <laughs> you know uh, it's 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 sad and we all and it's it's this like kind of nice moment when you walk in and I see Ace and, or I see Jeff Agpalo or I see um, whoever else. And it's like, oh, good, nice. Cool, I have someone with me. Um, and it's, it's also, I, my sister brought this up the other day in which um, how I feel about classical music in general being this Eurocentric um, based model in which we're performing works by Europeans and white folks all the time. And like, that's the Brahms, that's Verdi, that's Mozart, you know, and we, we haven't been able to lift up the voices of Asian composers and black composers and Latin American composers and all other composers that, that need their voice to be heard because they have just as beautiful music. It's just, for some reason, we haven't been able to, to find a way to perform them and to find a way to um, give them their due so to say. Uh, to add this on a personal note, so I'm, uh, well, I like to consider myself as an actor. And uh, when I was auditioning for uh, schools, uh, for high schools, when I was in eighth grade, um, the thing that I was told was that, oh, uh, like you said, Ace, like there's a lot of less uh, representation in Asian men in particular. And they were like, oh, you have a higher chance of uh getting into this school because you're, you're an asian boy there's not too many of those and two things it it felt like they were underplaying like uh downplaying like my talent as an actor but it also uh it, it, it felt like it didn't feel like uh it felt like forced um representation it didn't feel like um deserved rather than uh earned I don't know what I'm saying, but you, you get the idea, right? Yeah, so like they were putting you up there so they could say they had representation. Is that exactly. what you mean? Yeah. I mean, it's just how it is. So that goes into the next question. How difficult uh, would being Asian affect uh, in your industry? Would it, be, would it affect how you would uh, do in your industry? Um. Well, I mean, being an artist is hard anyway. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say that I've ever experienced any overt racism um, in in a professional setting. Uh, I'm really thinking hard on it, and I really can't can't think of one. Um, what I would say is that I 
have experienced some sort of microaggressions and that also um, applies to my life in general. <laughs> um, I think we can all, all sympathize with that. And, and the biggest one is not actually what anyone has ever said or done necessarily to me. It's this feeling of uh, being in a room and being overlooked. Um, I just think of in, in social settings, especially if I'm in um, social circles that are predominantly white, just getting in the conversation can be um, can be a task. Uh, and, and you just, I just get this feeling of invisibility, um, sometimes. Um, and if, if that's what my experience is in, um, in general, in life in general, then I have no reason to believe that really that behavior and that kind of interaction would be different in professional settings as well. Um, I know that, um, in auditioning, um, and also no, working with uh, the colleagues with whom you are um, you have auditioned with. Um, I'm trying to find a good way to say this. Um, <laughs> it's it's like you know what you have to offer, and you you know the skill level of others in the group, um, and you wonder why you haven't gotten that promotion. Um, and it's so it's it's instances like that. I've never been said you don't look the part. Um, or anything like that. But then again, I haven't done a whole lot of, of theater on my own. I am willing to bet that that I would um, I would come across that at some point. I watched your uh, uh, episode, what was it, last week? Uh, that was uh, mostly actors. And, and yeah, that was a really cool conversation um, to, to hear as, as well. Um, so yes, I'm glad that I that I haven't experienced anything overt, but there is that that sort of like othering uh, sense of being othered that that you just sort of sense and feel and you know it's there. Yeah, Ace, that that was that was on the nose. In terms of, it's more of a um, a culmination of microaggressions rather than big um, big swinging hits of of I guess what's the opposite of microaggressions? You know, um, you know, in when we think about the classical music genre especially singing, you know, the music is usually put to the forefront in terms of, um, you know, like if he looks or if he looks like this or he's as he's this tall or this big, it doesn't really, it shouldn't, I won't say it doesn't, but I'll say it shouldn't really matter as long as the music and his voice is great or his playing is great, his technique is great. Um, music is supposed to be the thing that transcends all that, um, of course, in in singing very specifically, um, it's it can be. I've experienced it maybe one time. I won't name the company, um, but I remember not getting cast or being cast in something smaller because um, they said, like, "Well, a you're you're going to be too short. Um, you're going to be too short for the leading lady." I mean, I'm five eight. That's not like short. Um, like the the person singing the who would have been singing opposite of me would have been like, I don't know, five, nine with heels, um, which I'm like, okay. Um, and then, you know, I've heard of other colleagues just saying like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of be kind of weird having an Asian lead in this opera because he's supposed to be doing this, like he should be doing. And um, Ace and I know a Filipino tenor in Chicago that like exclusively does these character roles. Um, and there's something to be said about playing those those type of roles where you're like oh kind of like the scene stealer or like very big acting kind of but you're not you're not really the leading character type um i was watching another zoom call a long time ago with um, a few leading uh asian tenors um in in america and they they experienced a very similar thing especially in europe um they would they would just be told to the face by companies like we're not we can't hire you you're you're not going to look good next to this person um you know like basically by saying it by not saying it but it's like you're you're asian like you can't there's no way you should do it when you should be just i sing this well that's what should be put on stage i mean there's operas already in itself is suspension of dis of disbelief so like 
what's there not to believe if like of course there's not real thing as a magic flute you know <laughs> it's just like yeah like just be part of the story listen to the music get get in it so getting back to what ace said like it's a lot of microaggressions and being othered that we have to deal with a lot more um and i know from a f from a few friends who are um violinists and violists that they kind of have to create their own click within themselves um just to make sure that they're they're not other because they're being othered together you know it's just this unique way unique little in between thing of like yes we are part of the BIPOC but also we are kind of overlooked when in that in that conversation yeah i feel like it's a very gray area um because I know that I've done like choir and musical theater a lot and I have been getting I've been getting cast as like the lead who I played Sophie in Mamma Mia and she's like white and I'm Asian but I do feel like um like with rehearsals and everything people kind of not belittle you in a way but it's like subtle things that they do that like microaggressions like you mentioned before um, and it's like, you're there, but they're kind of like ignoring you in a way or ignoring your potential, which I like definitely agree with you guys. Um, so do you guys have anyone you look up to or adore or inspire that is Asian and in your industry, or it doesn't even have to be your industry, but just someone you inspire and look up to? Um, I would say not a singer. Uh, but very prominent worldwide and has a presence in Chicago as well. Yo-Yo Ma. Um, I wish I played the cello. Um, maybe, maybe someday. Maybe that'll be my next instrument in, in all my free time. Um, but not only is he supremely talented, but I just feel like it's so rare to encounter someone at that level who is able to just be so gracious um, and so giving um, of his time and talent. Uh, he's involved with the uh, community outreach programs with the CSO uh, and, and very involved um, in, in the communities here. Um, and he's, he's sort of the kind of musician and person that I wanna be when, when I grow up. Dang it, Ace, you, you took mine. <laughs> I literally have it like I have it like written. Oops, sorry. I have it like written right here, like Yo Yo Ma. Uh, we can share. Because, yeah, we can share. Um, uh, you know, like I, I said before, I played cello for ten years, and like that his CDs are what I listen to and how I kind of like practiced, and especially for um, the standard stuff like the box suites and stuff. Um, and then you know you don't find out about these musicians. They're like they're. Um, the good thing, the other things they do beyond their music until later on. Um, and I'm, I'm extremely lucky to be in Chicago and Yo-Yo Ma is one of the ambassadors for the CSO. And every time he's on Instagram, anytime I see him doing something, he's doing something that I wish um, more people would do, especially um, Asian musicians. Um, if, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna choose someone else, uh, I would just say like my mom, you know, like, a, Ace and I both have Filipino immigrant mom. My mom's a nurse um, and she just, she's saving the world right now as we speak, um, working in hospitals and they're, and you know, the, the Asians, at least Filipinos specifically, they're so loving and they want you to do, to succeed in whatever you're doing, um, no matter what you end up doing, engineering or being a nurse or being, uh, a doctor or whatever. Um, I have uh, my whole mom's family has a bunch of classical musicians and they each, we, they all go to each other's things, no matter if it's a, like a, let's say a community concert of something, or if it's a five hour performance of uh, Wagner opera. Um, and my, I remember my mom and dad had just came back from the Philippines um, for a trip. And I said, hey, it's like the closing night of this opera. And it's my first season at Lyric Opera of Chicago in their chorus. And it's closing night of, uh, uh, oh my gosh, Der uh, Meistersinger von Nürnberg, which is this five hour slog 
of an opera and they were jet lagged and all that. And they still, I got them tickets and they sat down, and they watched everything they took. They went to both intermission, they ate and they came backstage and did the whole thing. Uh, so I guess my heroes are my parents and my family. Sorry to be a little cliche about that, but. It's cliche, but it's cliche for a reason. Our parents are always gonna be our own personal heroes. How I got into a lot of things, even my parents, uh, I remember my parents used to dance like leisurely all the time. And I would, uh, as a little kid, I would cling onto their legs as they would, as they would spin around. And it was how I actually got into dancing. And uh, they put in all their effort for me to be, uh, to support me, which I'm not sure, uh, it's like your parents seem very supportive. So th there's, there's, it's, it's not exactly like, a, it might be a fine line uh, on whether some parents are supportive, oh, that they, they want you to be successful, uh, but also there's also, they also want you to be happy in, in what you pursue. Um, yeah, I agree with Brian. I mean, I'm Ch Chinese American, so my parents have been very supporting in anything I do and everything I do. But I know um, with like Asian parents, they are stereotyped as like tiger parents. So they're like, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, you know? So I feel like, um, I know a lot of my friends who do um, theater or like choir and stuff like that. Um, they do have parents that are like, oh, it's a difficult industry to be in. And if you're an Asian, it might be even harder. So it's like financial stability and stuff like that. And I know with like COVID, it's been like really difficult for the arts industry. Um, but for me, I'm really thankful that my parents have been supportive. Um, I know Brian's parents, have been very supportive in everything he does. And Brian, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah, of course. So uh, as Rosanna was mentioning, uh, COVID-19 is like affecting all of us. And as uh, an artist, how would that affect you in your life? I will first say that I am very fortunate um, and in that I have not been affected to the gr to the degree that many, 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 many of my colleagues have. Uh, I'm lucky to have um, a, a full-time job um, as a music director um, for a church in Evanston, St. Nicholas. I'm, I'm actually here in my office right now. Um, and, and they have been very gracious, um, as have uh, the many of the other arts organizations that I'm a part of have uh, mostly paid out um, at least portions of the contracts and also try to be creative and find ways to keep us engaged with our audiences and keep giving us work. So uh, just like many, many, many other organizations worldwide right now, uh, there's a lot of virtual content. Um, one of the groups I'm in, Chicago Acapella, um, is doing a uh, a virtual subscription package that includes virtual choir things, um, but also podcasts, educational things. Um, and they're giving us opportunities to do that. Um, uh, or another group I'm in, Fourth Coast Ensemble, it's a cha vocal chamber quartet, um, is in the process of rolling out this uh, digital concert hall type deal. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky, I'm fortunate to be in circles that want to rise to the occasion and aren't just um, are focused on not only surviving but but really thriving. So, but but I know the reality is that many um, are are struggling, um, and I'm thankful to, to you guys and, and everyone for and everyone who's doing this to to bring attention uh, to that uh, because there there also unfortunately is it isn't a whole lot of solidarity uh, within classical music spheres, I feel, because there's just such a disparity. There's there's uh, the stars at the top, and then there's like all of us <laughs> sort, of, sort of right here uh, working in the middle. Um, and sort of on that same theme that I, that I talked about, it's not necessarily just um, Asian Americans, but but just this feeling of being overlooked that is, is, is a theme here that we have to um, find solidarity where we can um, and get people's attention and, and start to make those changes. Uh, I'm 
in a similar boat to Ace, but slightly different. Um, so I don't have a full-time job. I've been fully freelance since I've graduated, but it's this like weird hybrid type of freelance because um, I sing with the, with three, three AGMA um, contracts in Chicago. AGMA, the American Guild for Musical Artists is the union for um, not only classical singers, but um, dancers and stage management as well. Um, so I sing with the Lyric Opera of Chicago and their chorus in their core supplementary. And I sing with the Chicago Symphony Chorus and I sing with the Grant Park uh, Chorus as well. And so I remember all three of them actually decided to pay out a portion of what they were committed to, um, which was extremely helpful in the beginning. I remember just scrambling and you know, taking a look at my, my accounts and uh, figuring out like, okay, do I need to get a subletter? Do I need to, what, what do I need to do? And um, I ended up kind of living at my parents' place as we kind of figured it out just because it was in the suburbs. And I, I kept my apartment because I wanted to be like, well, I still have my place in the city if whenever things go back in three, in three weeks. <laughs> uh, so uh, that, there's, always, there's always that. Um, but I've been extremely lucky just because um, just long term, my parents gave me a great um, sense of financing in terms of like, OK, make sure you save money, uh, make sure you um, have a Roth IRA, make sure. You so I had like all those very adult adulting type of things like ready for kind of this exact moment. And especially with the payouts and everything. Uh, and for a good solid month and a half, I was just like scouring the internet for any arts uh, relief programs. Um, there were like a few grants out there. Um, one was through my union. Uh, one was through just like you kind of, people were just posting like apply to this, they're gonna give you $500, gonna give you thousand dollars. So I got, you know, a handful of those as well. Um, so there are so many people that are hurting. Um, and I know a few of them and they've had to um, change careers, um, you know, try to become a real estate agent or going back, they went back to school. Um, and just because they're like, well, I can't, I can't hover. I can't do, I can't do nothing and wait for this back open. So um, a lot, the, the music world is, has lost a lot of talent because of this, um, just because there's no way, uh, it was such a fragile, I won't say existence. Um, it was uh, something that was always in flux, you know? I, I consider myself extremely lucky just because I had three big contracts that I could basically depend on for the bulk of my income and then freelance the rest and be totally fine and be able to have savings and be able to contribute to my retirement plan and all that. Um, but, you know, for others, it's just been really hard. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I've, I've been extremely lucky. And, um, and we are almost on the other side of this, but we just got to stay home. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of um, arts venues have also closed and now they're not going to open anymore. Um, also, speaking of COVID, one of our partners, they're called Be an Arts Hero and they're trying to get the Dawn Act passed. And that Dawn Act gives um, $43 billion um, in, $43 billion for um, arts workers. So if you guys wanted to check that out, <laughs> link in description box. And um, why do you think it's important to diversify the arts and classical music? It's a big question. Um, um, I think just on a very base level, um, we want everybody uh, to be able to see themselves um, represented, reflected in that way. Um, when you turn on the TV, go to the theater um, and all of the actors on the stage, <laughs> if none of them look like you, 
um, then it sort of sends the subliminal message that you don't have a place at the table. Um, and, you, you know, we, we don't want to be in a position uh, where we're, we're dependent on that, uh, but, but at the same time, um, if, if that's, if that's all our, if that's our only experience, then it sort of diminishes um, our own self-worth and, and it can really, uh, you know, a lot of artist types have this imposter syndrome anyway, where they don't even feel they're, they're worthy. But um, yes, I, I think just showing um, and, and artists are supposedly the ones to, who are supposed to lead the way in this and say art, art is, you know, music is a universal language um, and it brings people together. Um, and I think it really um, is about, at the end of the day, living up to that. Um, if it is really universal, then it should look that way. I mean, harken back to, you know, the statistics of it all, you know, the Asians make up 60% of the world's population. Um, you go into any major city, you hop on the train, um, you're going to see a wide range of people on that train. Um, you're walking down the street, you see, you see the faces of the community. And then you go onto television and you go, you go to a concert and then where are they? You know, um, and it's not like they're not trying to get the job. You know, there are plenty of colleagues of mine that I've been chosen over them and they've been, they've always been looked over. Um, there are just, I, I don't want to say less talented or less qualified um, white people that are in the industry now that are working much more than their uh, BIPOC counterparts. Um, and at this point, it's, it's kind of, you kind of have to force the issue and in, in order to um, gain the correct representation of what the community is to be reflected on stage. Um, right, right now, I applied to a fellowship um, in St. Louis for um, arts administrators, to people who are considering a transition to be an arts administration. And the big thing was that it was looking exclusively for people of color. Um, and it's this fine line of saying, we highly encourage people of color to apply as opposed to like, we will be hiring people of color. Um, and it's because people are, companies have to walk this fine line because you know, this in, in the classical music field, it's donor driven. And right now it's a bunch of very rich white folks who fund all these companies. Um, and the sad part is too, is that um, they're all getting old and they're, they're starting to um, pass away. And the new, the new generation of rich people um, aren't buying into the old system. You know, like, have you heard Jeff Bezos, the Jeff Bezos Arts Foundation? No. Have you heard of the uh, Steve Jobs or the Apple Arts Foundation? No, I mean, I'm sure Jeff Bezos could save the arts period with with the click of a button with like, without feeling anything about it. But uh, harkening back, that's a different, that's a different soapbox to stand on. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like it need right now in order for the correct representation to be shown on stage and on screen, it has the or the issue has to be forced before it becomes the normal. You hit on an interesting point too, Jared, uh, where it's very donor driven, and we're really we're really dependent on rich, uh, deep white pockets, uh, and then that's then that's who we're serving. Uh, so not only is there the issue of we don't see uh, certain types of people on the stage, we don't see those people in the audiences because what we're focused on doing um, is not bringing more uh, people of color um, in into the theater as well. It, it's 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 about following the money, 
which again is tangential to another bigger soapbox that we probably don't have the time to get into right now too, but, but we have to consider um, our audiences too um, and diversifying that in addition to diversifying um, what's on stage, who's on stage. Yeah, I agree. Um, I know I was talking to the city council a few months ago about our budget cuts towards um, like elementary schools and whenever there's like an issue with funding with any like public schools, they cut arts program, arts and programs, arts and music programs first because they don't think it like has any value or something. But it like arts in general brings a lot of like joy and love to our world. And when COVID hit, we were listening to music. We were watching Broadway shows. We were watching films and movies and we went back to the arts and the arts brings a lot to our economy and like really just like brings us together and unites us together. Um, I know with like Broadway, um, there's very little Asian American representation there. And there was like an increase during um, the years when Miss Saigon was opened. And then after that, um, there was like no arts work there's no Asian American arts workers um, on Broadway. So I'm really happy that you guys came here so we could like talk about this issue and spread awareness um, about that. And Brian, do you have anything to add on? Yeah, uh, on, on a closing note, cause we're running short on time. Uh, what advice would you give aspiring artists who would per want to pursue music in the future? Could be anything. But... Uh, well, let's see. I'll, I'll harken back to the Broadway thing real quick, um, just because there's like Miss Saigon and then there's King and I, you know, those are like kind of like the bread and butters for the Asian American community. Um, and I, I, I'm happy to see strides being taken in that because um, someone who I did King and I with at Lyric went on to be the first Asian American um, Christine in Phantom of the Opera right after that. Um, and then she has since, she finished like maybe four or five years on the show. Um, and then she's on to bigger and better things. Um, and I'm like, I'm happy to see that the new Blues Clues host is Filipino and he brings his, um, his Lola on the show. So I, I feel like we're, we're making headway um, in that, um, but opera still needs to catch up too. Um, advice, I would say, um, follow your gut. Uh, it's, it's not easy. It's really not easy. You have to work extremely hard to get, there are going to be hundreds of people trying to get one spot. And uh, sometimes that one spot really is not a great spot. Like there, there are so many times in which I've gotten ready to audition for something. And then I realized I literally would make more money being on unemployment than if I were to take a job like I'd sing like one of these like singing jobs that hundreds of people, uh, young people especially are trying to get. Um, so it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It's really hard um, and you have to really love it and you have to really work at it. Um, and it takes continuous work. Um, so your heart has to be a hundred percent in it. Um, and I wish anyone the best. Um, trying to go into music. Uh, it's my life, it's my blood, it's my driving force. Um, but I also I have to remind myself that it's not only that and I need, uh, you need to make sure that you have other loves um, to turn to, especially when you're out of work, you know, you can't, sometimes you're in a place where you can't practice or you can't look at a screen for another thing for any longer. So um, it, you need to be really in love with it, but you need to make sure that you have other loves in place so that you can balance it out. Love that. Um, and there is a lot that I, that I would tell a younger version of, of myself and, um, and any younger student artists who are coming up. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it con concise though. Um, first of all, be like Brian and Rosanna, like you're talking to city council, like what? <laughs> I would have, that, that's totally not something that I would ever have the guts to do um, as a high school student. So good, good on you. Um, uh, I can offer a couple other things maybe. Um, I think um, some of us are really good at doing what we are supposed to do and being good students and following the, the right career paths. Um, but understand that 
especially in a field like the arts, your career is probably going to take you places that you didn't expect. Um, and to, to be open to that um, and to make the kind of art that you want to want to make. Um, you won't always be given an opportunity to do that uh, from someone in, in, in power, uh, but you can find ways to create that space uh, for yourself. And, for, and you'll probably find people who think a lot like you as well um, uh, in the process. Um, and the other thing, um, I'm sort of preaching to myself here um, in both of these things, but don't wait until you are happy with what you are able to offer before putting yourself out there. Um, I'm such a perfectionist um, and I've spent a lot of time telling myself, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. Um, when in reality, if I just put myself out there, um, you know, people will, will, people will see who you are if, if you show them, um, imperfections and all, because nobody is perfect, uh, but those who dare, um, to be brave and to be vulnerable, I think get recognized for what they do. So, so take the leap is what I would say. Great, so um, on a closing note, do you guys have anything that you want to share or promote? Uh, let's see. Um, oh my gosh. Before, yes, um, I would say I'm currently contracted to be in a Chicago Opera Theater's production of Il Postino, um, which they'll be live streaming um, in the middle of, or the end of April. Um, so I believe that's still a go. They're currently, I think right now they're doing an online uh, live performance of a Rimsky Korsakoff um, thing right now. So Chicago Opera Theater is really doing some um, innovative uh, digital content, which I'm really proud of them and I'm really proud to be associated with them on that. Um, I would have promoted any other, the, the other contracts I had ready going for me, but that's the only thing I have on the horizon for now. Um, but if anybody has, has any spare time, they can check out my website at jaredvsguerra.com. And I sort of gave my, my, a uh, couple of my groups a shout out already, Chicago Acapella, and Fourth Coast Ensemble. Um, one of the uh, silver linings throughout all this is by moving virtual, we're able to reach audiences just beyond the Chicago area. Um, and folks like my parents and my friends from, from all over have been able to, to tune in um, through, through the various events. So uh, Fourth Coast Ensemble, Chicago Capella, check us out. Uh, so yeah, thank you for being here with us today. It was really interesting to hear uh, what you had to say. Um, yeah, so um, the links that you, the things that you promoted, we'll link it down in the description if anyone's interested. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I personally had a really great time. And Ryan, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, that's it. It was nice meeting you two. Likewise. Likewise, more power to you both. Good luck. Thank yeah. you.